Good afternoon and welcome to our final faculty lecture of Alumni Weekend, Censorship of Radical Ideas Across Centuries with historian Ada Palmer. I'm Katie Malmquist, Associate Vice President of Alumni Relations and Development and Associate Dean in the college. And on behalf of the entire UChicago alumni team, I wanna thank you for joining us today. Every year, Alumni Weekend is a time to gather together to celebrate the global alumni community, your connections to each other and to campus and the spirit of continued inquiry. This year, we're excited to bring that same energy to you wherever you are. Though, of course, we really look forward to welcoming you back to campus soon. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Ada Palmer. Ada is an associate professor in the history department at UChicago. She is a cultural and intellectual historian focusing on long durée intellectual history and the recovery of classical thought in the Italian Renaissance. Her published monograph called Reading Lucretius in the Renaissance uses Renaissance manuscript and print editions of Lucretius's Epicurean didactic epic, De Rerum Natura, to expose how humanist reading practices controlled the distribution of newly rediscovered radical ancient philosophy in the 15th and 16th centuries, and how this affected the capacity of classical radicalism to influence scientific and religious thought at the dawn of the modern era. Much of her research has been conducted in rare books libraries, especially in Rome and Florence, where I know many of us wish we could be traveling um, and hopefully will again soon. Uh, in, in Italy, Ada worked with Renaissance copies of classical texts, both manuscripts and printed books. She's also been a Fulbright scholar in Italy and a fellow at the Vill Villa E. Tati Harvard University Center for Italian Renaissance Studies and an ACLS fellow. In 2013, she won the Itati Prize for best article by a junior scholar and the Selma V. Forkosh Prize for the best article published in the Journal of the History of Ideas. In addition, Professor Palmer also recently won a Quantrell Award, which recognizes U Chicago faculty for exceptional teaching and mentoring of undergraduate students. Now, before I turn it over to Professor Palmer, there will be a Q&A session at the end of her presentation. And we're gonna ask you to please submit your questions for Professor Palmer in the event chat box uh, when we get there. So without further ado, welcome Professor Palmer. Lovely, thank you. Uh, and hello all, I will get our PowerPoint going. So I came to my interest in censorship via a combination of an interest in um, radical thought, and then you can't look at radical thought without looking at how widely it manages to be disseminated uh, without, uh, in, in cultures that are hostile to it. How is it that even with vast censorship apparatuses, nonetheless radical ideas managed to proliferate? Uh, and so that was the beginning of my project on censorship. But what I'm going to share today is an overview of work that I've done collaboratively with a number of other faculty, and there are some links for downloadable versions of the, of the collaborative work, where we've looked at patterns in the structures of censoring bodies. Uh, because in order to understand how radical thought can proliferate and uh, thrive in communities that are hostile to it, we have to understand the patterns in how censorship works. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. And I trust that my PowerPoint is working. You can never tell on your end of the Zoom, but if it's not, I'm sure Katie would let me know. All right. <clears throat> Why do we censor? What are people thinking when we choose to censor? When we want some piece of expression to be silenced, limited, or destroyed? What recurring motives can we find in the censorship programs of the past? Today, using a variety of historical examples, I'm going to try to get at the motives which make people willing to participate in censorship, which in turn can help us understand the motives shaping new calls for censorship that are affecting us in the digital revolution. From Facebook's censorship advisory board to the Great Firewall of China, globe-spanning censorship pro projects are developing all around us, and we cannot resist them or even understand them if we don't understand the real motives of censors. We shall begin with the imagined censor. 
Winston Smith sets out in the morning for his job at the records department of the Ministry of Truth. He will spend his day combing through newspapers and archival material to edit speeches, falsify predictions, erase deleted persons, and invent false pasts that serve the state. While his colleagues in the ministry churn out propaganda and mindless entertainment and edit and overwrite the works of Shakespeare. Winston's Ministry of Truth is, quote, an enormous pyramidal structure of glittering white concrete, soaring up terrace after terrace, end quote, dominating its landscape and employing countless thousands of citizens. It has perfect access to all copies of all media and a budget so vast that it can dedicate a whole team to surveilling the thoughts and actions of each citizen like Winston. It is effective, inescapable, driven by the will to power, as Orwell puts it, a boot stomping on a human face forever. And it is entirely impossible. Eileen Blair bids good morning to her husband, Eric, and better known as George Orwell, and sets out for her real job in the real censorship department of the Ministry of Information in London, which during the Second World War was located here uh, in, this, uh, in this building in the Senate House of the University of London, which was the model for Orwell's description of his Ministry of Truth. Eileen, a former journalist and editor with a degree in educational psychology, who with her husband had worked for the Republican side of the Spanish Civil War, will spend her day going through private correspondence and cutting out sensitive content, specifically references to troop movements, names of specific personnel or prisoners, discussions of resources or reflections on morale, which might be revealing to the enemy. The task is huge and Britain's wartime uh, Ministry of Information is desperate for funding and perpetually understaffed, recruiting women, students, anyone. They are constantly backlogged and driven by the desperation and frantic desire to survive against what feels like an overwhelming enemy. Our real censor Eileen has a mix of motives, patriotism, fear, the basic need to earn a salary, while the public around her views her work with a mixture of wariness gratitude, acceptance, and some curiosity about the psychological experience of being a censor. Do you ever think of the censor, writes Sylvia Townsend Warner to her friend composer Paul Nordoff in a letter uh, that she knows will be read by censors like Eileen. Rooms full of ladies and gentlemen all engaged in the embarrassing occupation of reading other people's letters? What will they do when they can't be censors any longer? Will they pine and languish and suddenly feel themselves cut off from humanity? Or will they demonstrate their freedom by never opening another envelope, not even the envelopes addressed to them?" End quote. For wartime Britain, rooms full of ladies and gentlemen engaged in a strange and awkward occupation was entirely accurate. And in fact, wartime censors sometimes went so far as to add information. In this letter from an American First World War soldier, Jim Thierfelder, to his fiance back at home, he described his location simply as somewhere over there, self-censoring his whereabouts, which he knew he was not supposed to expose. But the censor has added in the comment, he can tell this person in England. Thierfelder's collected letters also feature numerous comments where he or his fiance, straying toward romantic or sexual topics, cut it off with, but I'll spare the censor. This polite, sensitive censor is not in most of our minds when we imagine the censor today. Orwell's 1984 gave us an invaluable vocabulary for thinking and talking about censorship, surveillance, and totalitarianism, terms used around the globe and recognizable by millions more than have read the original novel. So iconic is 1984 that when people perceive crisis, we reach for it as a tool and rallying cry, as we have seen in the recent authoritarian surge. Alarm bells go off the instant people see censorship which resembles Orwell, which creates a corresponding weakness or failure to observe when censorship begins that does not resemble Orwell. Corporate censorship popular censorship, censorship demanded bottom-up by parents, teachers, or profit-seeking industries, these are also major shapers of censorship, both past and present, 
we need to bring these motives back into our understanding of the drives behind censorship if we want to understand what's happening in the current information revolution. The importance of understanding censors' motives crystallized for me in a class at UChicago. Uh, in a discussion a few years ago, we were meeting in Regenstein's Rare Books Library and comparing two volumes, this controversial medical work by Girolamo Cardano, which in the 16th century was condemned by the Inquisition, and a professional censor has gone through this copy and faithfully destroyed the forbidden passages. That is the Inquisitor's signature on the title page indicating that the expurgation is complete. We paired this volume with this rare book, a copy of the third Twilight novel, in which the mother of the then underage owner cut out the sex scene with scissors and used Sharpie and Whiteout to efface sexually explicit language. It is exactly the same physical act, cutting pages out of a book and obscuring text so our discussion focused on why our visceral responses to the two acts feel so different, why the one feels amazing and the other almost makes us chuckle. Our discussion focused on the different power relationships involved, the different motives, but one comment struck me. The difference one suggested is that the mother believes she's doing something good. Of course, it only took a few seconds for other students in the class to say, Wait, the Inquisitor also believes he's doing something good. He believes he's protecting Catholic readers from a dangerous heresy. He thinks that's a good act, just as the mother thinks that she is protecting her daughter, just as those who demand censorship on Facebook or in comic books or in film or in the bottlerized family Shakespeare, they all believe they are doing something good. Uh, the student's first impulse in the class, however, was telling our expectation that bad censors like the Inquisition should know they are bad uh, and that they're motivated by malice, by the will to power, by Orwell's iron boot stopping a human face forever. We tend instinctively to call things censorship primarily when we perceive those involved to have bad intentions. We tend to excuse or discount censorious actions when we perceive the motives to be good. To understand how real censorship works, we need to thank Orwell for the tools that he's given us, but push back as well and reintroduce the fact that most censorship is not motivated by a sinister will to power, but by other motives, including the desire to protect, a sense of crisis, fear, patriotism, even love. This letter, sent from the trenches by First World War poet Wilfred Owen, looks like it passed through the same censoring process which employed Eileen Blair, but the black ink is not a state censor, it's the poet's brother, Harold, who censored Wilfred's letters before publishing them after his brother's death. Harold's autobiography claims he censored the passages to protect personal details about friends or family, but Jean Cannon and a research team at the Henry Ransom Center, Harry Ransom Center, have shown that Harold actually sought to censor and conceal Wilfred's shell shock symptoms because of the stigma attached to mental illness. Love, the desire to protect a re reputation or a loved one, these motives mingle in cases like the Owen letters or the letters of Renaissance radical Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, whose nephew excised radical content before publishing his letters, changing invocations of plural gods to singular god, uh, and making the work seem more orthodox and more in line with the nephew's Protestant sympathies. Protestantism uh, hadn't started when his uncle died. Even the infamous interventions of Elizabeth Foster Nietzsche inserting anti-Semitic and pro-Nazi sentiments into her incapacitated brother's works, mixed ideology and white supremacy with family bonds, a twisted caregiving, and the desire to make her brother's legacy shine in what she thought would be a great new Nazi era. And while the Telegraph here is quick to call Foster Nietzsche's alterations criminal, the legality of such interventions is, like most private censorship, messy at best while the consequences of these interventions actually make Elizabeth Foster Nietzsche one of the most influential interveners in political thought in modern times. As you can tell from my choice to include Foster Nietzsche, I'm defining the scope of censorship very broadly 
in this examination, including not only government action, but private censorship. Civilian bodies created to rate or censor media, public efforts to exclude books from schools or communities, and corporate censorship, both profit-seeking and political. Not everyone defines censorship so broadly. In fact, there has been a subtle and uh, telling multi-year battle waged over this in the comment section of Wikipedia's page on censorship in the USA, in which activists, especially from the American Library Association Office of Intellectual Freedom, have tried to defend the page's coverage of non-government censorship in the US against opponents who insist, as you see here, that only state action is real censorship. And that any analysis, such as the report cited here from the watchdog group Reporters Without Borders, which claims that America has anything but perfect free speech, must be invalid. It is important to examine how state and private censorship operate differently. But for me, one fact makes the suggestion that we should look at state censorship by itself without other forms of censorship a non-starter as a suggestion. The Inquisition was not the state. It wasn't. It was an international organization aiming at universal authority, but negotiating with local governments and rulers, sometimes collaborating, but just as often competing with government and using the international apparatus of the Dominican and Jesuit monastic orders to cross borders and set up local operations, less like government than like Doctors Without Borders or UNICEF, and with the same idea that it was doing public good. The pre-modern Inquisition was also radically plural. Um, uh, radically plural with decentralized local chapters spread around Europe's global empires with radically different policies and operations. For example, while inquisitors in 17th century Central America funded translations of religious material into indigenous languages and spent many, many hours ensuring the accuracy of indigenous dictionaries, much more so than policing enlightenment texts. At the same time, inquisitors in Portuguese controlled Goa in Western India ordered the eradication of indigenous languages and the blanket burning of all texts in Sanskrit and Konkani, regardless of content. The more I study the inquisition, the more uncomfortable I get with using the singular at all to describe a set of very plural operations which enacted conflicting policies, published competing lists of banned material, and often overlapped. Multiple inquisitors from different branches operating in the same space and overriding each other. For example, in colonial Mexico, where inquisitors from Jesuit and Dominican branches competed with others authorized by local bishops or by the Spanish crown and its governors with orders or by Rome, a system of competing jurisdictions easily gained by those who had the right cunning to, okay, mom says no, we'll ask dad. These plural inquisitions were sometimes funded by states, co-opted by states, used by states to scapegoat their adversaries, but they were not the state. In fact, it feels strange to say so, but there is nothing in the First Amendment in the U.S. that would prevent an inquisition from operating just like that in the U.S. now, since we have legal procedures for private prisons and private police forces. While various specific actions would be prohibited by individual laws against torture or religious restriction, Congress shall make so no, no law does not mean private citizens may make no inquisition. In fact, the Inquisition did operate in the US, claiming force of law over American Catholics enforceable by excommunication into the 1960s. And Catholic students at U Chicago had to get notes of permission from a bishop to do their homework if professors assigned Thomas Hobbes or Machiavelli, listed in the up-to-date 1948 Index of Prohibited Books. Censorship is often plural, often private, often popular, and we learn more from the motives of the private citizen who cheerfully attends a book burning than we can from Orwell's imagined O'Brien. A quick and dirty institutional, oh, that slide is in the wrong place, sorry. Uh, a quick and dirty institutional history of the plural inquisitions will show the first of several important patterns shared by many censoring bodies. The pattern being that they tend not to be intentionally created for a particular pre-planned censorship project, 
Rather, censoring bodies tend to be hastily improvised as responses to a perceived crisis or emergency, often repurposing extant infrastructure. The first inquisition was created in the 1100s when authorities in France demanded a legal framework to combat the Cathar and Waldensian movements. And the international infrastructure of the Dominicans was repurposed for that task. Again, think Doctors Without Borders. By 1252, the Pope authorized the use of torture by inquisitors and local branches started being adapted for local uses, including witchcraft trials, the policing of public morals and local political dissidents. This infrastructure, which was already having political uh, applications far beyond anything the church was interested in, then proved ideal when Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain wanted to persecute former Jews and Muslims in the later 1400s. When the printing press came in and Rome decided it needed to regulate the printing press and issued a 1515 order that books must be examined by church authorities before publication, inquisitors were in place to take on this new task. The Reformation then kicked that into high gear, leading to the newly centralized Holy Office of the Inquisition in 1542. In later centuries, the Holy Office continued to be repurposed when new crises loomed, from Galileo to Darwin to communism, all the way into the 20th century, and all wholly unrelated to the original medieval theological crisis, which had led to creating the original Inquisition, but it was repurposed over and over for new perceived crises. This pattern holds broadly. Governments and popular movements facing perceived crises, which may or may not be real crises, and often tend to repurpose extant infrastructure. For example, one major censorship crisis came with the development of talkies, this shocking moment when suddenly people could say bad words in movies. Many countries, including New Zealand, Australia, and the USA, responded to talkies by repurposing post offices and customs inspectors to search for film reels, watch them to see if they had profanity and confiscate them. The same methods, post offices and customs inspectors were used to censor photography as uh, porno pornographic photography spread, ordered to intercept and destroy and punish the creators and circulators of the material these governments wanted to censor without the passage of any new law to do it. In another case, one of the darkest memories in the history of modern New Zealand is the 1951 dock workers strike. During World War II, dock workers had worked 15 hour days loading and unloading ships without extra pay because the island nation depended on its ports. But when peace came, shipping companies kept demanding the same hours with no extra pay. And when dock workers went on strike, the government took advantage of not yet repealed emergency laws left over from the war to declare it sedition to support the strike, either newspapers or individuals, even by giving food to the families of supporting workers, but especially by publishing about it. Closer to home, in the same year, um, the University of Chicago censored the Maroon. Student editor Alan Kimmel had attended a communist world youth rally in East Berlin over the summer. Uh, and at the same time that the university was protecting its communist sympathizing faculty, the dean of students stripped the maroon from funding and shut the paper down, saying he would reinstate it only if they ousted this communist sympathizing editor. And after weeks of student protests and articles across the country, the maroon yielded and he was ousted. The budgeting process for school clubs was never intended as a tool for censorship. Um, and the uh, nor were New Zealand's wartime laws intended to weaken unions. Nor was the US Patriot Act passed for the crisis of 9-11 intended to use to target immigrants or DACA children. Nor did the medieval Frenchman who asked the Pope to create a tool to deal with the Cathars that they were afraid of imagine that it would ever be used to persecute scientists or undiscovered peoples far across the seas. These cases show us two principles of censorship. First, that a large portion of censorship is carried out by reusing existing institutions or policies that were never intended to censor, like the post office or the funding of school clubs. And second, that once created, a tool that can censor will be reused to censor later, to censor different things. 
So whenever we feel the impulse to create a tool for censoring something that makes us uncomfortable, we always need to ask ourselves, how will this tool be misused in future by people I disagree with? To give two further examples, in 1954, uh, the moral panic, uh, which came to a peak in the English-speaking world, claiming that violent and sexually explicit comic books were causing so-called juvenile delinquency. This led England, New Zealand, and Australia to set up government systems for censoring comic books. But in the USA, restricted by the First Amendment, the government found a workaround, which is the usual US method. Congress pressuring comics companies to create these theoretically civilian and voluntary comics code authority a civilian organization which screened and censored comic books before printing them, giving them a seal of approval, which then allowed them to be sold in shops. Created in the 50s to police violent and sexually explicit images, the, as the civil rights movement gained momentum, the comics code censors began by nitpicking images of uh, comic books with positive depictions of black characters, censoring as overly graphic and dangerous to the youth Images as innocuous as sweat on the forehead of a black astronaut and making comics with black characters more likely to need to redraw pages, miss deadlines, lose money and face cancellation. This kind of censorship of the civil rights movement was not what the comics code was created for a decade before, but it was very easy to reuse. More recently in 1990, you know, Australia introduced an internet censorship system intended specifically and exclusively to target child pornography sites, in which government employees were hired to identify sites and add them to a block list. The block list was secret, since it would be a giant list of where to find child pornography. But when watchdog organizations noticed discrepancies between the number of blocked sites and the reports of prosecutions for child pornography, that and other suspicions and pressures got the government to change this system and eventually to reveal the list. When the list went public, it was discovered that 90% of the blocked sites were not child pornography. I'm going to repeat that. These censors were hired to censor one specific thing. That was their mandate from the government, child pornography. But 90% of what they secretly blocked were unrelated things that they personally thought were bad adult pornography, violent images, terrorist recruitment sites, LGBT sites, suicide guides, marijuana growing instructions, bomb making instructions, numerous things that many people feel are dangerous, which led these well-meaning censors to overstep by 90% the legal and lawful purview, purview of their office. These cases remind us of the conclusion that uh, most people who censor believe themselves to be doing good, to be especially protecting someone. I want to dig a little deeper into the Inquisition, which certainly believed it was protecting something. And we can learn a lot from the motives of censors when we look at their actions. First, we learn that their goal was not to destroy information. Look again here at Cardano's treatise. It took a professional inquisitor hours to go through this using the index, which specifies exactly which passages have to be crossed out and painstakingly scratching through every line, preserving the rest. It would have taken seconds to throw this book in the fire. The Roman Inquisition was constantly complaining, lamenting in documents about their lack of funds, their lack of personnel, their desperate pleas to local governments to cooperate and send them resources. This was not the Spanish Inquisition under Ferdinand and Isabella, whose anxieties about Jews and Muslims led them to shower their Inquisition with funds. This was the Roman Inquisition so overwhelmed by a tsunami of Protestant heterodoxies that by the mid 16th century, their project to publish and keep updating an index of banned books had fallen so far behind that they had to, uh, here you can see them keeping the index of heretics. There's uh, Martin Luther and Zwingli. Um, they fell so far behind that they, were, they had to uh, fall back on shortcuts such as uh, condemning Erasmus, but then elaborating that actually most of it you can still have because it's too complicated getting rid of all of our textbooks. Uh, you just have to cross out like the front uh, or condemning here uh, defenses of Zwingli generically, even if their authors and titles are unknown and too numerous to elaborate. 
later versions of the Inquisition's index, knowing it would be out of date before it was even published, resorted to such blanket categories as condemning anything printed on a printing press that had printed the works of Martin Luther, uh, since such a press was in a way contaminated and also was very likely to be printing similar radicals whose names they didn't yet know. To make matters more complicated, rival indexes were being printed by competing inquisitions, especially the better funded inquisitions of Spain and Portugal, whose inconsistent judgments Rome raced to keep up with. And Rome spent a lot more time worrying about how to regulate rival inquisitions than it actually did looking for particular heresies, especially things like atheism, which it didn't have time to worry about when it's worrying about keeping control of Spain and Portugal. In such a perceived crisis, to invest all these hours in expurgating this one book rather than destroying it wholesale shows first an enormous value placed on the remainder of the book, but also something else must be happening to make this worthwhile. They're erring on the side of keeping, not destroying. The Roman Inquisition and other branches, even little ones like this one on the island of Malta, kept copies of all its banned books for reference, for the use of inquisitors and experts in creating reference libraries of banned material that they could use to identify banned texts that they circulated under false titles and to compare new suspected authors with old ones to see if they were advancing uh, already condemned ideas. Accumulating new books, even heretical books, was a positive and necessary step when done correctly. Private individuals could also apply to the Inquisition to have a license granting permission to own and read banned books. Applicants would explain their reason and list the specific titles they wanted. For example, a doctor might request to read the medical works of Protestant Dr. Leonard Fuchs uh, or Pliny the Elder, an ancient work whose natural histories had been condemned for a brief little bit that can denies the immortality of the soul. The applicant would have to promise to ignore the heretical content and focus only on the medical information. These licenses could be issued by inquisitors, bishops, Vatican envoys, even secular rulers with papal recognition. So many overlapping authorities had the ability to reject and you could go to one and then go to the other. Harvard historian of science, Hannah Marcus, one of my collaborators in the group project, examined over 5,000 licenses issued mainly to doctors and found that repeat applicants who returned to renew their licenses after the three-year expiry date often coasted on that trust to ask for things that had nothing to do with medicine, like the Decameron or banned satires. Policies that let a doctor borrow this material did not aim to destroy information. It aimed to curate access, creating concentric circles in which elites such as doctors or monastic orders had greater access. Lucretius's epic poem De Rerum Natura is another scientific work which denies the immortality of the soul. And its association with such infamous radicals like Pomponio Leto, who was accused of conspiring to assassinate the Pope, did not result in it being banned. In fact, we have a letter of um, uh, Inquisitor General Ghislieri discussing Lucretius as an example of a work which does not need to be banned because, quote, everyone knows to read it as a mere fable. But when a century later, Alessandro Marchetti a mathematician and contemporary of Galileo translated Lucretius from difficult Latin into easy vernacular Italian. He was denied permission to publish. And when it was printed anyway after his death in 1714 with a false London imprint to conceal what was probably a Venetian edition, only then was the long infamous Lucretius finally banned in Rome. This 1564 classroom edition, I love this one, uh, specifies in the editor's introduction that the text should be taught in Latin classes to make sure that vulnerable youths encountered the dangerous ideas with a teacher there to chaperone them and explain the difference between true and false. The logic here is clear. Readers were considered to be in a hierarchy of trust with mature Latin reading experts expected to be resistant to dangerous ideas. Elite students in the middle needing a little gui guidance and the less educated public with no Latin, they were considered to be so vulnerable that they couldn't have the text at all. 
Hierarchies of trust like this are visible all over the Inquisition's practice. As Hannah Marcus put it to me over coffee, any doctor could get a hold of Pliny or the Decameron, but if you want Galileo, you better be a Jesuit or a king, or you're not getting it. But if you were, you could. Uh, and rulers could demand not only that local Inquisition chapters give permission for them to have banned books, but for their courtiers and their librarians to be able to share their banned books with anyone the Duke admitted to court, creating islands of privileged access supervised by the state against the witches of the church, which the Inquisition complained about but couldn't stop. This is a very close parallel. Here is one of these libraries that had these licenses. This is a very close parallel to the modern case in the USSR, when works like Plato and Shakespeare were purged from Soviet libraries, but kept in elite libraries reserved for the use of inner party members, a project overseen by Nadija Krupskaya, the main architect of Soviet book censorship. She's really neat, although not studied enough in her own right, because she was also married to Lenin, so she's usually discussed as a wife rather than an amazing architect of a, of a system. Similarly, in China today, elite universities and inner party members are given much freer access to uncensored internet than regular universities or regular citizens. In sum, many censorship projects do not aim to destroy information. They aim to curate access, segregating readers into those of greater or lesser trust, be the categories nobility and commoners, inner party or outer party, or adults and children. Back to the Inquisition. Uh, one thing inquisitors could do, even if kings demanded that they have banned books, was set conditions on accessing the banned books. A common requirement for securing a license was that the owner promised to expurgate or black out certain banned part of the books. In a medical book, doctors would often be required to efface the author's name and image a kind of damnatio memoria, which leaves the content, the information, completely untouched. Cutting the condemned name out of a book was another practice, and even a condemned place, such as Amsterdam, might be cut out of Amsterdam printed editions. Here in Erasmus's edition of Horace, you can see his name has been effaced and his commentary symbolically crossed through without destroying information. Spending hours and hours crossing out a name, crossing out a name. This is not about destroying information. It's about drilling in the lesson that a heretic is bad and dangerous, as a teacher might have a student copy a didactic mantra onto a chalkboard. Similarly, in this 16th century encyclopedia of animals, I love this one, by prolific scholar Conrad Gesner, and Anne Blair at Harvard has great work on Gesner. He's amazing. Uh, you see here on the title page, the title page, the professional inquisitor's note, cum expurgatione, confirming that the expurgation of this encyclopedia has happened. The work is full of images. There's the signature. There are some of our wonderful creatures. Look at these wonderful, look at that beaver. Um, and there is nothing in this that has anything to do with Gesner's Protestantism, which is the reason for him to be on the index. But the Inquisition nonetheless ordered expurgation so complicated that Gesner's entry in the encyclopedia uh, goes across multiple pages. What had to be crossed out? Often it was Gesner's name, uh, but for this encyclopedia of animals, there's his, his name transformed into gibberish to try to make the book less ugly. In the Encyclopedia of Animals, he, like a good scholar, credits his sources. Uh, and he always says, you know, this picture of a guinea pig was sent to me by the learned and excellent doctor so-and-so from such and such place. The Inquisition's command is every time he thanks someone, if the Catholic reader wants to have this, they can have the guinea pig, they can have the article. But whenever a scholar who's being thanked is a Protestant, the reader must black out learned and excellent because Protestants aren't learned and excellent in the Inquisition's eyes. Protestants are bad and wrong. And going through thousands of pages, blacking out every time there's a praise of a Protestant, again, transforms this bestiary into a tool of religious education. The Inquisition's lesson, Protestants are bad, is reinforced turning a secular work into something that reinforces the, con the um, confessional divide. 
This is a didactic tool. Having people, and especially even professional inquisitors, go through and cross out names and meaningless little praise phrases that aren't the core content. Spending hours on that is absurd if your goal is to destroy information. But its goal is to affect thought. Um, this is why it strives to be so visible, not veiling its presence, but declaring its presence with these big, dark lines. This is censorship that wants to be seen like the Comics Code Authority wants to be seen, like the uh, Great Firewall of China wants to be seen, and many internet systems want to be seen. Unlike Winston's Ministry of Truth, which wanted to conceal when it censored things, even internet censorship today makes a point of letting you know this isn't just a bug or a blank screen. We are censoring you, covering things with warnings to make you conscious of the presence and power of the censoring authority. Book burnings, our symbol of censorship, are also similarly more about power than they are about destroying information. Post-printing press, it became effectively impossible to eradicate a published book, no matter how hard one tried. Pope Gregory VII back in the sixth century AD could aspire to effectively eradicate Sappho because only a few manuscripts existed. But the eradication of a printed book after its dissemination was an impossibility. And book burnings, while still a core practice of censorship around the world, turned into symbolic book burnings, which are about projecting fear or rejection rather than actually hoping to destroy every copy of a text like here, Harry Potter or Fifty Shades of Grey. This works just like how fascist led book burnings, uh, burning the books of communities they sought to oppress, did not genuinely think that they would destroy all existing copies of the Talmud or other core Jewish books. The goal is to terrorize the community, to destroy the resources of individual people and to send a hostile message, which is not the same thing as destroying information. The one chance to eradicate a book post printing press before is to intercept the edition before it goes to booksellers. But even this usually fails. This is an 18th century criticism of Jesuit education by Portuguese Enlightenment leader Luiz Antonio Verne. And it was printed in Italy and then intercepted at the port uh, when it arrived in Jesuit run Portugal before it was distributed. The whole print one was intercepted and destroyed before it came off the boat. And nothing survived except the printer's copies in faraway Naples. And yet, this is a copy of the second edition, which appeared in Portugal with a false imprint under a false name within months before Naples had time to send another copy. How? The Inquisition kept a copy, as usual, and one of the Inquisitors, himself an Enlightenment sympathizer, republished the book himself in secret. Censors were, after all, intellectuals, trained on the latest works and with access to radical materials, so they were often themselves a point of permeability where control broke down. In France, as Paris grew as a printing colony and intellectual capital capital, royal pressure transferred censorship work from the Inquisition to his own censors. And working as a royal censor, there you see with uh, printed with privilege of the king, avec privilege du roi, working as a royal censor was basically an easy first job to get out of college for a young lit major, employing numerous young intellectuals educated in the same circle that produced Voltaire, who were hired to censor by day while often writing their own books by night. Robert Darnton, whose work I can't recommend enough if you enjoy just reading history for pleasure, anything by Robert Darnton will be fantastic. Uh, he has found cases of young radical leaning censors shepherding each other's works through the process, literally writing letters to each other. Jacques, I got your book to censor today. Don't worry, I'll do a good job. French censors sympathetic to the Enlightenment project, which goes all the way up. The King was also uh, sympathetic to this. Let the encyclopedia the main central text of the Enlightenment as we understand it, be printed, printed freely in France, intentionally turning a blind eye to its radicalism. And seven volumes had come out before Rome's always understaffed censors caught up with it, read it, and said, no, banned this. Even then, the French inspectors were so sympathetic to it that 
you know, that those whose job it was to intercept banned books at the border would let the encyclopedia that was being continued in Switzerland be smuggled over the border so consistently that people who were publishing more radical things like pornography or atheism or the Marquis de Sade, which is both, would smuggle those into France by wrapping them inside copies of the encyclopedia, a banned book hidden in a less banned book, taking advantage of the permeability of the human censors. This is another pattern. Uh, that systems are made permeable by sympathetic actors on the inside, which is why the transition to digital censorship with unmanned filters is so alarming, removing that human element. Although even here, these have, things have to be designed by information experts who are often sympathetic to uh, those seeking information and will therefore help them bypass it, as is this interesting case from China recently. Though usually they will only help bypass it for those they trust, for elites, those they think are safe possessing the material. Again, censorship creating circles of elite access and segregated access. Since our time is very finite, uh, and I know we have to wrap up really fast. Oh no, it's 1.50. Um, I want to get to reviewing the patterns so far, but I have to really quick talk a little bit about how uh, profit seeking is a part of this. Uh, but we're short on time. So I'll just say that we must never underestimate how much of censorship is enabled by people who don't care about the ideology, but realize that they can profit from it. Uh, be this the politicians in the U.S. and Britain who in 1954 realized they could use the moral panic of the comic book movement to ride their way into office, pretending to care about it when they really didn't, uh, or the new EU internet censorship laws which were written by Disney and Facebook to uh, pretend to, to protect people from misinformation but actually uh, put up barriers to, the, uh, to new rivals starting up. Um, to the origin of copyright itself, which began in London when a printer's guild realized they could capitalize on people's anxieties about a popish plot to convince people to use this wave of grassroots anxiety to create a censorship system which would be overseen by the stationer's guild, which could charge fees for it and therefore get rich. Uh, some of our first conversations about censorship and copyright arise from these profit-seeking motives in which people who don't care about ideology at all often uh, affect things. One final point before our review. Um, one reason there was so much fear of Catholics and radical voices in the 17th century when copyright was born is that they were living in an information revolution, much as we are living in an information revolution. And information revolutions are the moments when frightening voices become loudest. Uh, working with my colleagues Kathleen Ballou and Adrian Johns in the history department, we've looked at what we call the early adopter effect. Adopting a new information technology has a cost, whether in buying new equipment or just the fatigue of learning a new app. And you've all felt that, oh no, not WhatsApp or disk. I don't want to learn a new thing. First adopters of a new information technology have strong reasons to make that leap, meaning they are the groups who are not being able to communicate under the old system, including those who are being censored. Kathleen has done brilliant work on the Ditto machine, which during the mid 20th century caused a revolution in inexpensive small scale printing. Uh, in addition to teachers making homework, Ditto machines were used by newsletter makers which caused many communities to be able to communicate for the first time. Aquarium hobbyists, Trekkies, civil rights activists, immigrant groups, LGBT groups, all of these couldn't communicate via newspapers or magazines, but also the KKK, whose growth over the 20th century from near dissolution to its present resurgence can be traced to among other things, ditto machines making newsletters easier to share. Early adopters of information technologies fill those new media with things that have been silenced before, things therefore that contain stuff that is scary. Uh, and so the most conspicuous users of any new media will highlight the voices we're most uncomfortable hearing from. To sum up, returning briefly to Orwell, 
if the ministry of truth exercises power which is centralized, top-down, power-seeking, carrying out a stable multi-year plan with an infinite budget and staff dedicated to destroying information and encouraging self-censorship, real censorship, in contrast, tends to be decentralized with plural decision makers. Uh, necessitated by imperfect communication, making it easy to exploit in small places, individual towns, individual regions. Real censorship tends to be bottom up or grassroots um, rather than top down. Real censorship tends to repurpose, uh, tends to aim to protect, seeing itself as present preventing harm. While those with motives such as profit tend to hide behind the excuse of protecting others and deny that they are doing bad censorship. Real censorship tends to repurpose earlier infrastructure and be hastily improvised in response to a perceived crisis, whether a world war or the many crises that shaped the early inquisition. Real censorship tends to be short on staff and funds, resorting to such tools as terror, symbolic book burning. The Roman Inquisition knew it could not keep all Protestant books out of Italy any more than the USSR could keep jazz from circulating on bootleg records made from x-ray films. Real censoring bodies therefore tend to recognize that destroying information is impossible and they aim instead to control who can access what and to cover media with permissions, restrictions and reminders of their power. This serves the major trait shared between both real and imagined censors of the Ministry of Truth, that projecting power and reminding people of the presence of the censoring authority aims to encourage self-censorship. When we look at the most infamous thing the Inquisition ever did, the condemnation of Galileo, we ask ourselves, was Galileo's trial a success or a failure? We would say it's a total failure if its goal is to silence Galileo It made him more famous. If they wanted to silence him, they should have made him disappear, which they knew how to do and which Orwell certainly understands. What Galileo's trial did succeed at was frightening Descartes into self-censoring and spending years revising his new treatise to make it much more Catholic and much more orthodox, having an enormous impact on our intellectual history, just like Elizabeth Foster Nietzsche's manipulation of her brother work. Hence my biggest conclusion, the majority of real censorship is self-censorship, or the majority of self-censorship is intentionally cultivated by an outside power trying to cause that self-censorship to occur. Power is not the end, it's usually the means to something censors see as good or protective. Most censorship does not seek power for its own sake, but perceives itself to be protecting some vulnerable category. These methods are used and designed to spread warnings, and they vary by time and by culture and by technology, making our new moment one in which we have to be on watch for how scared we become, how willing we become to create censoring apparatuses when we see scary voices become the loudest due to the early adopter effect which makes us more willing to create new apparatus in the perceived crisis, which will be reused by others after us with very different agendas that we cannot anticipate. Those are my conclusions about the structure. I'm sorry that it was a little long, but I think our intro is also a little bit after the hour. Um, there's a link that they're gonna share with you from which you can download a PDF of the catalog of the um, museum exhibit, which had most of these images in it and has many more examples of censored books. Uh, so you can download that and enjoy. We had that in Regenstein. And there's another link where you can get to the video series and see me and other researchers on the history of censorship past and present in dialogue, all of which is free on YouTube. But I will now pause and welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ada. That was absolutely fantastic. Gives us so much to think about. We have a number of questions, and as long as you don't mind staying a little bit after the hour, um, I'd like to get through a couple of them. I don't think we'll be able to get through them all, but I want to start with a question from um, one of your former students, um, uh, Lawrence Warner, who writes in oh. his note that he's Hello. <laughs> uh, also known as Cerulean, and I hope that means something to you. I don't, I don't know what it means, but um, he asks, um, well, a, a two-part question. One, he said, um, 
curious after a, a, been a couple of years since he was in your class and has the experience of the, the chaotic last few years, presumably, you know, US politics and um, all that um, sort of has culminated over the last year um, through the pandemic and, you know, sort of um, uh, extremism that we're seeing. Um, has that changed the way you think about censorship, having lived through these last couple of years? Um, and part two of his question, um, what do you think the role of fictional art is in fighting disinformation? So I would say that the biggest change in my understandings of censorship over the last few years has been to become very aware of how much manufactured crises are used not only to justify censorship, but also to distract from the creation and decisions that affect it. So most of us have been watching the news a lot in the last few years, but very few people are aware that you know, major policy decisions that utterly up, uh, overturned the way copyright of news works, uh, the way the ability to launch new websites works, were passed in Europe last year that almost no one is aware of in a, what was a very corrupt and manipulated situation. Uh, and no one was talking about it because we were busy talking about Trump and we were busy talking about the toxic things that this or that person has said on Twitter becoming a news item. Um, so that decisions that are going to shape who owns the news and who has information, there's a great book by Will Slaughter on this called Who Owns the News, decisions that are going to shape that for 300 years were made with almost nobody paying attention or helping to defend freedom because we were too busy being upset at what was happening with hate-filled speech going back and forth between our politicians. And we need to work on our ability to pay attention to those things that are setting the infrastructure for future crises, even though present crises are constantly also drawing our attention away. So I'd say that's the, the big thing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We also have a question from uh, uh, John Bryant, who asks about um, how editors should handle texts that have had that, that have been expurgated. And he mentioned specifically Moby Dick, um, having been uh, you know, edited for sexuality, religion, democratic politics, et cetera. Um, how can modern editors incorporate evidence, this evidence into their digital editions or put another way, how can scholarly editors edit in order to raise reader awareness of the causes and effects of censorship? So a lot of it depends on what we have. In some cases we have the original uncensored version or chunks of it or you know two things side by side or in the case of something like the cardano we do have the ability to see what it says under the ink uh, and so we can print editions that have the complete text or even better editions that have the band bit in a different font right or the band bit in italics or bold so that as you read through you can be aware of what was erased which is a very powerful way to do things um, uh, in other cases, we don't, but you can have in your introduction a discussion of, of, uh, of what was there and what was not. And even that was sometimes done long ago. So this is an edition of the poetry of Petrarch. Uh, and this is a Baudelaireized edition. It was printed censored. Uh, and one particular poem, the one that was on the right-hand page, is a poem about prostitutes sleeping with the Pope. And it was replaced with a much uh, milder edition created by an anonymous person who was hired to work on the edition. Um, but in the back, there was a printed index of which bits had been censored. And mm -hmm. you could go through and as this owner of the book has done, paste a new piece of paper in and rewrite the original uncensored poem over the censored one if you want the uncensored version of the text. So similarly, there's been a lot of discussion recently about, I forget whether it was Huck Finn or Tom Sawyer, I think it was Tom Sawyer, which has the N-word. And when it's being taught in schools, do we replace that or do we leave it there? Another option is we put a discussion in there that says this had the N-word. It's up to you. If you want to write that back in and be conscious that it was there and have that reminder, you can do it. And if you don't want to, you cannot. Um, so that it becomes a lesson about the text and the text history by preserving both the censored and uncensored versions. After all, this reader has censored and destroyed the original Baudelaireized not naughty poem that the poet wrote to make for the Baudelaireized edition, destroying one poem to replace it with another. 
uh, it's interesting to think about how we feel about that because we feel okay about it because we don't respect the work of the Baudelaireiser. But then you think about it and you're like, actually, I'd like to see what that poem was, but it's been destroyed. Um, so keeping both uh, is the great thing that an editor can do. And when we don't have the original to have a note of, this is the sort of thing that was usually censored. This is what is likely missing. That is really dangerous. However, it has to be done with great care because we are all when people are not specialists do it they're really wrong most of the time about what was removed mm -hmm. particularly people will expect for example that the inquisition was anxious about atheism and there's a lot of expectation that atheism would have been censored or that people self-censored and removed atheism from stuff but when we actually look at it the inquisition most of the time did not have time for atheism atheism was like priority 57 they're worried about Calvinists and they're worried about Jansenists and they're worried about rival inquisitions and there's this amazing case in um, that's really telling in the Caribbean where like you know boats are arriving this is the early 18th century boats are arriving with Montesquieu and Voltaire and like early enlightenment stuff and Spinoza which we think of as what should be you know target number one for the inquisition and they're like whatever but there's this napkin and it has pictures of people doing stuff. It has words on it in English. And it's in English. And what if it's Bible passages? What if it's Bible passages in English? Because the version of the Inquisition's index they were using at the time uh, specified that if you read any portion of scripture, uh, even a single sentence in vernacular translation, you were instantaneously damned without the possibility of repentance or redemption which meant they can't read the napkin to check if it's bible passages and they're like months and months of letters back and forth like trying to figure out are these bible passages can we bleach them out is it going to be safe is it going to cause people to be instantaneously damned with that and you know eventually they figure out it's the life of the lord mayor of london but months right. of energy on this and you know voltaire fine so there's so much more of the, the radicalisms we think they should be censoring like atheism that people could talk about actually fairly freely in a number of these contexts um what they're censoring tends more to be theological doctrines that we as modern people don't know about unless we're specialists in that particular set of decades uh, but an editor who's really researched the text can look into that and find it and say here are what the top priorities of the inquisition were at that time because they shifted hugely uh, and the final detail i'll give for that one that helps you understand this is when you go through the records of the roman inquisition there are only 12 trials which were about science out of hundreds of thousands of trials about things like protestantism or witchcraft or other, there are only 12 they're all from within a decade of one of, of galileo they're all in one patch that was what the inquisition were even about then uh, and so it was censored then and not before, because before that they're worried about Luther and after that they're worried about Jansenists and then communists. Uh, so it's whatever they care about at a particular moment that's censored and we can't understand it unless we zoom in uh, to put those details back. That's fascinating, super, um, you can see easily see how complex it gets. So um, one last question comes from Joanna Bryson who asks, um, uh, is the expression of censorship, for example, by internet pages, is it always an expression of power, which is something that you suggested? Or is it sometimes a protest against government interference, or as you said, at least a disowning of responsibility? So I would say that um, a disowning of responsibility is, in, is indeed something that some uh, you know, social media companies, we can say, are doing where they're creating an intentionally toothless system in order to get people to stop criticizing them. Um, but another important version that proliferates in the modern world that I think is the farthest from power is when people put trigger warnings on their own material, right? I'm about to talk about this sensitive topic. Um, or, you know, here is my page for my non-adult graphic work. Here is the separate one for the other one, which people sometimes do intentionally. Now, even that is a result of pressures in our society, because the fact that we are anxious about images of breasts, for example, is a cultural thing that's been enforced by powers beforehand. Uh, but we don't necessarily ex experience lots of fear that makes us 
us do that. Uh, and that's a case where a person is doing that, not because they're thinking about that power, because they're expecting people to be hurt and they're thinking about being people being hurt. But it's the interior mindset that leads to the hurt that was in turn created by the censoring power. And if I can get to the right slide, I have lots of fun pictures of things. There's a nice penis. We'll be talking about that later. But um, do, 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 where are the Japanese? Here we go. So if we look at the history of censorship in Japan, for example, earlier Japanese censorship laws like the Tokugawa uh, Yoshimune policies of 1721 and 22, they didn't care about nudity at all. Nudity was not on their radar of a thing to censor. Depicting breasts was just fine. Um, what they were anxious about was Western ideas and, and stuff that was coming in from the Dutch through Nagasaki uh, that result in banning stuff. But then when you look at more recent, um, more recent censorship in Japan, it has absorbed the West's tensions about Sorry, there's so many, but I'm sure this picture is here somewhere. Oh, it did back. It went away. Well, anyway, uh, Japan has absorbed Western sensibilities about breasts being unacceptable and started censoring that and feeling anxious about that. And when you see a thing you feel should be forbidden, you feel feelings. Those are also related to power. Um, and so even as we are gently and sincerely censoring a thing that we're doing ourselves, the outside power is still involved in that, at a greater distance and with less damage, um, which leads to one of the conclusions I didn't make be a slide, but I think one of the biggest problems in the way we think about censorship is that we think about censorship as an aberration. Mm -hmm. We think about the world as naturally not having censorship and society naturally not having censorship. And then when things go wrong, then people introduce censorship. We have no cases with societies where there isn't something that's been tabooed, some effort to control. We have no cases. There is no such thing as a human society that hasn't had authority and perception and trying to say this may not be said, only this may be said. We have no cases. So a much more useful way to think about censorship uh, is as one of the elements of society's periodic table. It's always there. It's a component of society. It's never not there. Think about arsenic. There is arsenic in the room where you are. There is arsenic in your body. The problem is if there's too much arsenic and it's in toxic forms, right? There is always the impulse to censor and the impulse to silence, the impulse to segregate and say adults can have this and others cannot. That's always going to be there. Your society will always have those impulses. What you have to do is keep them from taking on their toxic form, keep them from concentrating, keep them from turning into things that can be manipulated by profit-seeking groups, by ambitious groups, by authoritarian groups. So just as we strive to make sure that, yes, there's arsenic in my body, but it's not the toxic concentrations or the toxic form, yes, the impulse to want to silence something icky, something that makes us uncomfortable, the impulse to say, I want to walk into the, the magazine store and not have pornography in my face. We need to make sure that those impulses, which are always there, don't create apparatus which will be repurposed by future bad actors to create the toxic form. But if we pretend that it's society is naturally free of censoring impulse and it only happens when something is going wrong, we'll fail to understand that that impulse is always around. We just have to try to make sure it makes as little destructive infrastructure as we can. Fantastic. So Thank you, Ada, for being with us today. We've kept you quite a bit over. We really appreciate all of your time. And I want to apologize to um, our guests whose questions we weren't able to get to. Um, hopefully this will not be the last time you join us for an alumni uh, production, but we really do appreciate it and um, uh, uh, look forward to hearing more from you. Yes. And uh, I think you have the links to the web stuff so people who wanted follow-ups can follow up there and find more stuff. All right. Thank you, Anna. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for joining us and sticking with us a little bit later today. We really hope that you have enjoyed hearing from RU Chicago faculty and from your fellow alumni over the last several days. 
I hope that you will continue to stay connected to the university. And one great way to do that is by visiting alumni.uchicago.edu for upcoming events and news from around the university. With that, I will say, have a wonderful afternoon and thank you again. Bye-bye everybody.